Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our Hong Kong U Ophthalmology Distinguished Lecture Series. Because of COVID, uh, our lectures have been postponed. And as you may know, this uh, lecture series uh, was conceived to engineer uh, topics around four different themes, including community ophthalmology, beyond ophthalmology, ophthalmic education, and research advances. Our first lecture, inaugural lecture, was delivered by Professor Watton Lee, and he gave a lecture on the development of ophthalmology in Hong Kong, which was, which was then followed by our second lecture, delivered by Professor Tony Lee Mark uh, from the Department of Clinical Oncology at CHK. He uh, talked to us about how to design transf transformative clinical trials and is under the theme of beyond ophthalmology. And today we have our third lecture, which is under the theme of ophthalmic education. And we are very much honored to have a very distinguished panel with us. Our speaker here, uh, we have Dr. Andy Zhang, and we also have um, three uh, consultants in neuroophthalmology. So it's actually a very special evening here in Hong Kong where we have four, I believe, uh, it, it, I, I can put it this way, four top neuroophthalmologists in Hong Kong. We have also Dr. Carmen Chen uh, from Hong Kong Eye Hospital, COS and consultant. And we have Dr. Nelson Yip uh, from uh, United Christian Hospital. And also we have uh, Dr. Lowell Chen. Uh, both of them are consultants uh, in uh, the hospital authority um, uh, hospitals. And this lecture, uh, we have three parts. Uh, the first part uh, would be delivered by um, Dr. Cheng, uh, which is followed by a Q&A, and then we also have a panel discussion on some cases. Dr. Cheng uh, is uh, our graduate, Hong Kong U graduate, 2000, and then he, um, he, he is first um, uh, job in Hong Kong is in Hong Kong Eye Hospital, where he uh, received his residence training before he went to the UK, Morpheus Eye Hospital and St. Thomas and Guys, under the mentorship of Professor Gordon Plant uh, for studying uh, neuroophthalmology. And then he returned to Hong Kong, and now he is honorary consultant in Hong Kong Sanatorium and Hospital. So, with no further ado, let me uh, invite uh, Dr. Chang on the podium, and then uh, Dr. Chen, Kamen um, Chen, and Well Chen can uh, perhaps uh, you can go back to the audience before joining our next section. So, Dr. Chang, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris, for your kind introduction. So good evening, everyone. Um, I'm so happy that after all these years, finally I can see many familiar faces in person here. So firstly, I would like to thank Professor Chris Lang and uh, the Hong Kong Youth Department of Ophthalmology for inviting me to join this lecture. It's my honor to be able to join this um, prestigious lecture series, and I'm very happy that I can be back to my alma mater. So, um, as uh, said by Professor Leung, uh, today is on ophthalmic education on neuroophthalmology, and our topic I'm going to share with you today is on optic neuritis. And when you see one, what should you do next? So, you know, neuroophthalmologists, as usual, seldom have anything to declare. So, now, when I start my neuroophthalmology training many years ago, and um, I find that the specialty of neuroophthalmology daunting as it's unlike other specialties. Now, when you see a cataract, it's a cataract. When you see a retinal tear, it's a retinal tear. And you know exactly what you need to do to help the patient. But when you see an optic disc swelling, it's a different story. You know that you still have many steps to go before you can establish the diagnosis and to uh, administer appropriate management. At that time, I always ask Carmen, what should I do? And Carmen's always tell me that, go back to the Bible of the neuroophthalmology, which are these two books. 
These two are the newest version, and I won't tell you the version that Carmen and I used at that time. Now, I diligently listened to Carmen and read up the books, and um, you know, as a Star Wars fan, I felt like I was given a lightsaber. You know, I can be a master Jedi in neurothermology. But in reality, is that when I go back to the clinics, I just look like Finn, which you know, accidentally pick up a lightsaber, can beat a few stormtroopers, but I'm nowhere like a master Jedi. So I was thinking to myself, what am I lacking to become master Jedi in neurothermology like my mentor, Dr. Gordon Plants? And after some time, I realized that apart from factual knowledge, I need a proper approach to neurothermological patients. And this approach is slightly different from ophthalmology, uh, to seeing general ophthalmology patients. And that's why initially I find uh, seeing neuroophthalmology patients a bit daunting. So my approach to neuroophthalmology after all these years is that whenever I see a patient, the first thing I do is to localize the lesion. And that's the most important thing. After you localize the lesions by the patient's clinical history or physical examination, the next thing to do is to generate a list of differential diagnosis. And usually with the, uh, uh, with, with the location of the lesion in mind and with the background clinical history uh, examination, most of the time you can generate a list of differential diagnosis, which guides you to a, a, a proper workup and ultimately to a diagnosis. But there's slightly difference in neurothermology. Many disease, neurothermological diseases, actually do not have a specific test. Like, for example, if you are PCR positive for COVID, you are having COVID. For neurothermology, it's another story. Many diagnoses are of clinical diagnosis, like non-arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy. And that's why you should need to monitor the clinical progress of the patient and see the treatment response. And you see that the clinical response or the uh, um, uh, uh, clinical progress is different from what you expected you need to think twice whether you are having the correct diagnosis. And of course, in neuroophthalmology, we need many good friends. Our neurologists, neuroradiologists, and neurosurgeons are our good friends, which we usually work as partners to help us to manage our patients. So um, before I get to, get to the main bulk, let's clear up some basic stuff. Now, neuroophthalmology is all about uh, seeing patients with visual problems due to neurological disorders. And by that, we need to know what normal vision uh, uh, makes up. Now, normal vision depends on the integrity of both the and, uh, afferent and the efferent visual pathway. For the afferent visual pathway, it's the sensory input from the retina to the visual cortex. And for the efferent motor pathway, it's the motor mechanism con uh, controlling the extraocular, mo extraocular motility, like you know, saccades to the uh, target of interest, and then have a visual fixation without any nystagmus or saccadic intrusions, and then accommodate to focus on the object. And uh, if problem arise in any of these, uh, results in an abnormal or poor vision. So the afferent visual pathway actually spans the, from the retina back to the visual cortex. So actually, the, from the front to the back part of the cerebrum is involved. And for the efferent motor pathways, the signals uh, arises from the frontal eye fields and the parietal occipital junction, send down signals to the midbrain and the brain stem centers of uh, gaze centers, and then to the effector nucleus in the midbrain and the brain stem. It also receives signals from the medulla oblongata, which actually, this shows that the whole part of the brain, from the cerebrum to the metaoblongata, is involved in normal vision. So there's no doubt that many neurological diseases can have uh, ophthalmic manifestations. So for today's talk, we'll focus on the, anterior, uh, the afferent visual pathway and mainly the anterior parts involving the optic nerve, optic chasm, and the optic tract. So as said, today I'll talk about optic neuritis. Please remember the phrase. Optic neuritis is the most common cause of unilateral residual loss with an RAPD in young patients with normal fundus and a swollen optic nerve. So whenever you see this scenario, think about optic neuritis. Now, to prevent sending all of you here at this time of the day after a long day work to a state of symptomatic narcolepsy, I now try to present with cases to prevent you know, too much factual information and send you all to sleep. <laughs> Now for the first case, it's a 44-year-old lady presented with a left bearing of vision, no pain, and um, she attended our, uh, outside ophthalmologist and with FAICG and OCT macula told to be normal. 
Now, I first saw her with uh, count finger vision over the left eye, left RAPD, no pain, uh, and a normal fundus. So, optic neuritis picture. So, the lesion most likely is in the left side of the optic nerve, which this visual view shows the left side diffuse loss and the right side non-specific loss. So, as said, loca localization of the lesion, left optic nerve. So this is the MRI brain of the patient. Uh, this is a T1 weighted facet image. You can see that the left optic nerve is a little bit thickened over here with a contrast enhancement, which the coronal cut shows you know, better, showing the parenchymal enhancement of the optic nerve. So this patient has a left optic neuritis. And is it enough? Of course, the answer is no. We need the MRI brain. The MRI brain with this flare and T2 weighted image shows periventricular plaques here. And in the axial scan, you can see the, they are perpendicularly oriented to the ventricle, so the so-called dorsal fingers. So of course, the diagnosis is obvious in this patient, multiple sclerosis-related optic neuritis. So we admit the patients, give three days of pulse steroid of the patients, and you can see that the patient's vision slowly improves, which this is rather typical for MS-related optic neuritis. You can see in a moment, uh, another patient's the the clinical progress or the response to treatment is a bit different from this one. Now, this one is a bit classic for MS-related optic neuritis. The visual view at about two months is, uh, you know, uh, grossly back to normal. So blood tests including acoporin for negative, patient refused lumbar puncture, and we gave the diagnosis of uh, demyelinating optic neuritis, multiple sclerosis related, referred to neurology, start on teriflunamide, and the patients have no further clinical attacks for four years. So this is the first patient. So moral of the story, MRI orbit with contrast is very helpful to help us to confirm the diagnosis of optic neuritis. And whenever you, first, whenever you see a patient with optic neuritis, remember, we must do an MRI brain because we need to exclude the possibility of multiple sclerosis. And do you remember this patient don't have any pain? And actually pain, if you read Western literature, is a very important symptom for patients with optic neuritis. But actually, we have demonstrated you know, with Carmen and Noel that uh, pain is not a prominent feature in us Chinese population. So remember, Chinese optic neuritis, pain is not a common feature. Okay, so our second patient is a 39-year-old lady, again, young patient, right blurring of vision, this time mild pain, admitted to a local hospital, CD brain and orbit with contrast normal, LASIK blood, FAICG normal. She was also told to have a, a right a constricted visual field. Uh, when I saw her, left, uh, the right eye, uh, light perception vision, RAPD, mild pain, normal fundus. So again, optic neuritis picture. Localization of the lesion, the right optic nerve. So this is the visual field, diffuse right side of visual loss. And this is the MRI. Now, remember, we said that the lesion is located at the right optic nerve. This is a stir image, and we can see that there is a T2 hyperintense signal over the, this part of the optic nerve, the intracanalicular and the intracranial portion. And that explains the poor vision because of the intracanalicular portion involvement. And this is the T2-weighted image. You can see that there is a, enhancement uh, over the parenchyma of the optic nerve. So it is the intracranial portion. So diagnosis, right optic neuritis. So we admit the patient again, give her a pulse steroid. The first day, the patient said that, oh, my headache is gone, and vision is greatly improved. You see, light perception to 2080, which is different from the MS-related optic neuritis just now. Now, this is more typical of those inflammatory type of optic neuritis. So we continue the pulse steroid, and uh, subsequently, the rheumatoid factors turn out to be a bit elevated, equal for negative. So the diagnosis is an atypical inflammatory optic neuritis. So because of this, we not only give the ONTT two weeks of pulse steroid, we slowly taper the pulse steroid for about two months, and the patient have no recurrence up to four to five years. So more of this story, again, MRI orbits, important to confirm optic neuritis. And we Chinese actually have more the so-called atypical optic neuritis. And my mentor, Gordon Plant, always said that being a Chinese in also is already an atypical feature of optic neuritis. And of course, never assume opti optic neuritis are typical as in Caucasians. And uh, we can see that the clinical course or the responsiveness to treatments can actually give us a hint of the underlying cause of the optic neuritis. So the third patient, 48-year-old gentleman, right blurring of vision, two weeks, 
uh, seen by ophthalmologists and MRI brain organized. But uh, of course, MRI brain is not a gold standard for diagnosing optic neuritis. So the report says that it's suspected optic neuritis. There's no pain. Uh, vision, count finger, right RAPD, fail color vision, no pain, and um, normal fundus. So again, optic neuritis picture. So supposedly the lesion is over the right optic nerve. But take a look at this visual field. Does it ring a bell? Noel not her head, so probably Noel knows the answer. Now you can see that there's the diffuse right visual loss, but the left eye, there's some temporal visual loss, ex temporal field loss, especially over the suprotemporal region. So this is a junctional scotoma. So where's the lesion? It's in the posterior optic nerve and the anterior chiasma over the right side. So we did an MRI. We noticed that this um, stir image, there is thickening of the right side of the optic nerve posterior and the involvement of the anterior chasm, and which is better shown in the uh, contrast scan. I can't move my cursor. Yeah, down below here. So this is the coronal cuts. We can see that the posterior part, the intracranial or optic nerve is uh, enhancing and involving the anterior aspect of the right optic chasm. So, remember this patient, chiasmitis, involvement of the chiasm. So, be careful of this type of optic neuritis. But still, we admit the patient's pulse steroid. And um, I was called on the first day. The patient developed hiccups after the first dose of pulse steroid. I prescribed Lagactyl to him, but it seems that the patient still complains of hiccups. So, does it ring a bell? So, the next day, I bring the films to our neuroradiologist, and we you know, particularly look at the medulla oblongata. And finally, we find this tiny little T2 hyperintense lesion over the dorsum of the medulla oblongata, which actually corresponds to the area prostrema. So, chiasmitis, area prostrema involvement, the most likely diagnosis is uh, NMOSD, even before the, available availability of the, uh, the availability of the blood test results. We know that this patient is likely suffering from NMOSD. So we continue the pulse steroid, and at week one, the vision is still 2040. We start to discuss with patient whether she, he wants a plasma exchange, but before that, his, he, his subjectively visual is recovering, so he turns us down, and after two weeks of steroid, his vision is back to 2020. This is his visual field at about uh, one month. So subsequently, the anti-aqua anti for antibody positive, we started him on acetylprin. This patient is um, seen by me a few years ago. If nowadays, probably I will start mycophenolate or rituximab. MRI spine normal, and the diagnosis NM NMOSD-related optic neuritis. So why is it important to diagnose NMOSD? Because if left untreated, it carries a high morbidity and mortality. Apart from visual loss, of course, spinal cord involvement can cause paraplegia, quadriplegia, or even brainstem involvement can cause respiratory failure, which carries a very high mortality rate. So acute treatment, uh, intravenous methylprednisolone, uh, if you know, rot responds well, we can have rescue therapy of uh, plasma exchange or IVIG, and for maintenance therapy, nowadays we usually go for mycophenolate or rectuximab. We also have um, very limited extreme experience of cetralizumab, but we don't have experience of eculizumab and inabilizumab. So moral of this study, whenever you do a visual field, please remember to do both eyes. Sometimes the patient complains of the right eye visual loss, but actually, in this, like in this patient, but actually the left eye also have a temporal field defect. So remember, for all neurophomological patients, do visual field in both eyes. Always remember NMOSD in uh, non-Caucasian population. And actually, we have done a study demonstrated that 4% of Chinese patients present with optic neuritis picture are actually NMOSD. And actually, this is in congruence with the, another study done in Tongren Hospital by Jiang Xiaojuan. Uh, she also did about 3 to 4% of the Chinese patients present with optic neuritis picture are, in fact, NMOSD. And for all optic neuritis, apart, you know, looking for the, the, the blurring of vision, the visual field, do remember the associated features like hiccups, symptomatic narcolepsy, or other features suggestive of myelitis. So the fourth patient, a 24-year-old lady complained of right blurring of vision for one week. Some pain, uh, MRI done outside show right side optic neuritis, started on three days of pulse steroid, and then a slightly lower dose and a you know, relatively shorter duration of uh, oral steroid and then stopped. And uh, she noticed blurring of vision again over the right eye three days after stopping the steroid. So best corrective visual acuity, uh, 2300, 
right RAPD, felt colored, uh, uh, poor color vision, right eye, no pain, no disswelling. Again, optic neuritis picture. So likely the lesions, again, in the right side optic nerve. So the visual field, diffuse right visual field loss. So most likely still the location is the right optic nerve. And this is the uh, similar, I must say, this MRI is not exactly for this patient, but it's pretty similar. Now, um, we can see that this, like this MRI shows uh, in the stir image here, there is a donut sign and dirty fat sign. We can see that there's a rim of T2 hyperintensity around the optic nerve, and the surrounding fat shows st st streaky uh, T2 hyper in uh, enhancement. And the contrast MRI uh, on the right side also shows thickening and uh, dirty fat sign. So this clinical pictures of, uh, M in MRIs suggest a diagnosis of optic perineuritis. So with, for her, we resume the steroid 40 milligrams, that means one milligram per kilogram for three weeks, and then we slowly taper and give a longer course of about three months steroid. Vision gradually improved, and the visual view back to normal. So blood workup all negative. I admit at that time I didn't take blood for the anti mock the myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein antibody because at that time it's not available, it's a few years back. And uh, nowadays if I see optic perineuritis picture, I'll definitely take the anti mock antibodies. So, um, moral of this study, always review the MRI whenever there is a typical clinical features or you know, when the clinical course is deviated from what you expect. Again, do not assume all optic neuritis are treated the same. ONT, uh, multiple sclerosis related optic neuritis, you can treat for two weeks, but most other optic neuritis, sometimes you need a longer course of steroid. In Hong Kong Chinese, again, our study demonstrated that optic perineuritis can make up about 14% of patients presented with, again, optic neuritis picture. So do remember, uh, it's best to review the MRI film yourself or with a neuroradiologist. So it's our fifth case. 45-year-old teacher complained of right blurring of vision, pain on EOM, um, seen by private ophthalmologist, noticed bilateral dyswelling, BP a bit highish, uh, slightly obese, and uh, she was referred to neurosurgeon for suspected uh, raised intracranial pressure. She was admitted to the hospital, MRI brain, MRA, MRV were normal. Lumbar puncture 19. She was given Damos, and at this time point, we were consulted because they realized that it's not elevated ICP. So when I first saw her, uh, right eye vision count finger, left eye 2020, right RAPD, pain, and this time bilateral disswelling. Now for bilateral disswelling, uh, you, this is the funder for bilateral disswelling, no signs of hypertensive retinopathy, LP still shows a normal ICP, so the most likely location of the lesion is still the bilateral optic nerves. So this is the visual field. Right side the diffuse loss, left side the constricted field. So, do you know what investigation is left? Sometimes neuroophthalmology can be easy. You just screen through what investigation has been done and what has not been done, you do it and you will get the answer. And that's the easy part of neuroophthalmology. So we did an MRI orbit. So you can see that there is, um, in this third image, there's a T2 hyperintense signal over the parenchyma of the optic nerve. And you can also T2 hyperintense signal around the optic nerve here, which is similar to the optic perineuritis picture. And you can see some a little bit dirty fat sign. And this can be better shown in this contrast film. The right side, the optic nerve parenchyma is enhancing. And for the left side is the rim of the optic nerve enhancing. And you can see also this streaky enhancement, which is called the dirty fat sign. So bilateral optic perineuritis picture. Oops, sorry. So we admit the patients, again, three days of pulse steroid. And when we first give the steroid, only one dose, the patient immediately, a few hours later, told me that her headache is much, much better. So after two days of pulse steroid, actually the headache has gone. And the vision gradually improved in the first week. So the steroid responsiveness is pretty good in this patient. So of course, Again, as I said just now, with the optic perineuritis picture, bilateral involvement, we need to think about the MOGAC, myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein associated disease. And actually, these patients turn out to be a positive for anti mock antibody. So the diagnosis is MOGAC. And actually, this is um, a, a, a pretty classic for MOGAC disease in adults. So this is the visual field, which is much better than before treatment. 
So moral of this story, MRI brain is actually not adequate for diagnosis of optic neuritis. You need an MRI orbit with contrast. And bilateral simultaneous optic neuritis is actually a atypical features for typical optic neuritis. It's an oxymoron, atypical for typical optic neuritis. For all optic perineuritis picture, do remember to check the anti mock antibodies. So, still awake, that's good. So the sixth patient, <laughs> still have two patients to go. I'm sorry for the you know, long uh, duration of talk. Now, the sixth patient is the 45-year-old lady, right blurring of vision for eight months. And uh, there is still optic swelling at this point. Do you think the clinical cause is, uh, of course, previous CT brain and orbits with contrast normal, she was being labeled as optic neuritis, treated accordingly, but the optic nerve swelling and the blurring of vision is still there. Do you think that this is compatible with a classic optic neuritis? The clinical course is deviated from what we expected, so we need to work the patient up. And um, when I first saw her, vision slightly uh, impaired, 2030, right RAPD, slightly slowed color vision, and there's optic disc swelling like this one, a little bit, you know, uh, optic disc swelling, and there is an uh, uh, optic disc hemorrhage. As said, what has not been done, we do it, we will get the answer. Uh, this is the visual field, and when we do an MRI orbits with contrast, we can see this tram track sign. So actually, this is an optic nerve sheath meningioma. So we refer this patient for a stereotactic fractionated radiotherapy, which she received 52 grades, and the disc swelling resolved and uh, results in an optic atrophy. Vision stabilized in the past three years. So again, for neuro, all neurotomological patients, you need to see the clinical cause and the treatment responsiveness. Many times with the clinical response, you need to revise your diagnosis and the management. So the last patient, 49-year-old lady, present to us with an acute onset, painless, inferior visual field defects. Seen by private ophthalmologist, she was told to have a right optic disc swelling, and the private ophthalmologist organized a MRI brain and orbit with contrast which shows no features suggestive of optic neuritis. I was, I, I, when I first saw her, vision, left eye slightly improved, uh, slightly impaired, left RAPD, slightly showed color vision, left optic disc swelling, which I'll show you in a moment, and there is um, uh, no uh, uh, other orbital signs or GCA signs. So this is the clinical picture. So the, right, the left eye, of course, you notice that there is a disc swelling, this hemorrhage. But what is important in this case is the right eye. What is important, what, what do you see in the right eye? It's a crowded disc. It's a disc at risk. It's a small clotless disc. Even in young patients, this 40 year old, you know, 40 something year old lady, acute painless visual loss, disc at risk. MRI showed no features of optic neuritis. You need to think about NARON. This is her visual field. We work, um, uh, uh, we review the MRI films with our neuroradiologists. We confirm that it is a well done MRI orbit and there's really no features of optic neuritis. And when you see a patient with a completely normal MRI orbit, do, uh, and it's a, of a good quality, um, think twice before you give the diagnosis of optic neuritis because studies have shown that if a properly done MRI orbit with contrast, the sensitivity of detecting optic neuritis should be around 94%. And this study was done in 2002. Now it's 20 years from now. MRI has advanced a lot from that. And I do very believe that the sensitivity of MRI to detect optic neuritis should be much higher than 94%. So if the MRI orbit's properly done, no optic neuritis, do things twice labeling this patient as optic neuritis. So we work up uh, this patient along those vascular risk factors. We found that this patient has undiagnosed hypertension and um, hyperlipidemia. So we refer to uh, the family physician for treatment of these vascular risk factors and um, start her on aspirin. So work up all negative, clinical diagnosis, NARON. And um, I discussed with the patients whether she wants a, a, a course of oral steroid as per the hay race uh, uh, protocol, but the patients deny the treatment. So, uh, at month three, the vision stable, no further deterioration, and this is her visual field, which is pretty similar to that as presentation. So, uh, uh, lesson to learn. Diagnosis of NARN is a clinical diagnosis. You need a history which is acute, painless onset of visual loss. Classically, it's uh, altitudinal visual field defects. The patient should 
you know, have a vascular risk factors, DM hypertension, ischemic heart disease, and smoking is also an important factor. And obesity, snoring, uh, uh, obstructive apnea, or sleep apnea is all other risk factors. And remember to look at the optic nerve morphology. The fellow eye will give you hints because the affected eye is swollen, sometimes it's a bit difficult to assess. The fellow eyes do give you hints of the diagnosis. And again, think twice to label a patient uh, as optic neuritis if the MRI orbit, which is properly done, is normal. So what do all these cases that we discussed just now uh, tell us? Uh, we can see that if we use a systematic approach to, 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 uh, to approach our neuroophthalmological patients, actually it will help us to better manage and uh, uh, quick, more quick, quicker to arrive at a diagnosis and start to appropriate management. And of course, the topic today is optic neuritis. Do remember the phase that I said just now. Young patients, unilateral visual loss with the RAPD, normal fundus or disc swelling, remember optic neuritis. Again, the systematic approach is that we localize the lesions first. And then with the clinical history examination, usually you can generate a list of uh, differential diagnoses. Work up the patients, start the treatment, and remember to monitor the progress. S like the patients with optic nerve sheath meningioma, is actually the clinical progress or the response to the treatment help us to deviate the diagnosis back to the normal track. For all optic neuritis, MI brain and orbits with contrast is the gold standard if, if available. And of course, usually we also need blood tests and sometimes electrodiagnostic tests to help us. Uh, do remember the difference between the optic neuritis in non Caucasians and ca uh, Caucasians. The literature do you, do we, we usually refer to are mostly for Caucasians, and we non Caucasians as Chinese are different from them. Uh, do remember all patients with optic neuritis do look out for other clinical features like the case of NMOSD. Of course, life is not that easy. You know, just now we see seven cases of uh, various optic neuritis, but these are the list of other differential diagnoses that I have seen over the past few years with patients referred to me of suspected optic neuritis. All kinds of bizarre optic, neuro uh, optic neuropathy and retinal disease can mimic optic neuritis. And of course, we are there to help, and hopefully if you have any problems, please we allow us to help you to arrive at the diagnosis. So last but not least, I want to use some time to advocate our group. Um, we do have a small society, Hong Kong Neuroophthalmological Interest Group, which we established in 2020, and Carmen is now our convener. And we are very happy to have uh, Dr. Miller and Dr. Plan as our advisors. And uh, Dr. Uma Pathy, which will be our coming commission trainer in January, February, uh, will be our commission trainer. He is a neurologist and um, I listened to his talk a few times. He's just like a walking encyclopedia. He seems to, you know, very, very uh, uh, interested in neuroophthalmology and very familiar with all kinds of topics. So please, if you are interested, do consider to join our groups. And actually, our last meeting is uh, last month, and we invited Professor Andy Lee from the United States, and he, told, he talked to us uh, on the disease called the SENSE, Space Flight Associated Neuroocular Syndrome, which is completely new to all three of us. Uh, we, it's the first time we, we know of this disease. So do consider to uh, join us or join our uh, later uh, academic meetings. We have regular academic meetings about three to four monthly. So thank you very much for your time.